What's going on guys, Greg here, and I'm super pumped for this episode because I'm actually going to do something a little bit different, and I'm gonna share an interview that I just did with Alex Hormozzi, and he is the author of $100 Million Offers, and I just had a chance to interview him inside of our free Facebook group. By the way, if you're not in that group and you're looking to grow and systematize your agency by productizing your services, check out the link in the description uh, because we do interviews like that and other free training all the time. So be sure to join that group. But because uh, we had a great conversation talking about how to basically build a grand slam offer, as he calls it, in your digital and or creative services agency by productizing, systemizing, and scaling your impact and how you can actually go to market, then you definitely wanna listen to this episode. It's longer than usual because of the, the nature of the interview. So I hope you enjoy. Let's just dive right in. Everybody, Alex Armozzi in the flesh joining us today. So it was kind of interesting. I posted in the group, you know, who would be interested. And I was like, I wonder like how many of my people know who you are. I was like, there's going to be some definitely. And it was like the most engaged thread <laughs> in our group. Like I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. So the message is spreading my friend, but guys, if you haven't gotten Alex's new book, 100 million offers, uh, check it out. It's on Amazon for, I think still 99 cents on Audible, and he has a free course at acquisition.com forward slash training, I believe, where he takes you through that content. So definitely check it out. We're going to be talking about that and a lot more today. So Alex, here's how I want to start this. So this group, right? This group is people that I would kind of consider micro agency owners. They're like, they're more than freelancers. They've got a little bit of traction, probably like lean and mean team, done for you services. Uh, some of them are trying to escape that altogether, add on consulting, move into training. Some are still rocking the, the quote unquote traditional agency model. And you've said in multiple of your interviews, but have never gone deeper on it. I just don't like the agency model. <laughs> so I'd love to understand how you unpack that a little bit. Um, Cause I feel like I know where you're going to take it. And I think I agree, but I've never heard you take that deeper beyond. I just don't really like the agency model. So can you explain what you mean by that? I think the agency model, as most people practice, it is not a sellable business. You know what I mean? I think that's that's the, like, if I were to say, like, one consolidated statement, that is it. Um, underneath of that, there's tons of sub buckets, but that's the that's the overarching piece. Underneath of that, I would say I don't like, like, pure service-based businesses in general, because if you were to plot things on a high value on one thing, and then how teachable a skill is on the other... Most things that are really teachable are not valuable. Things that are very valuable tend to not be teachable. Um, and so the more you invest in someone, the more flight risk you, you suffer from in a service, in a purely service-based business. And this is why most franchises that are purely service-based don't achieve nearly the scale that non-service-based franchises do. So if you look at like the biggest franchises out there, if you look at from a trend standpoint, they're almost all food-based because mm. a Starbucks coffee is going to taste like a Starbucks coffee because the machine is going to like the beans are going to taste the same as long as the, the temperature is right and they have the same amount of water, right? Your sandwich is more or less going to be the same because the same ingredients, right? But in the service business, for example, uh, let's say you were went to a massage parlor. It's very, very difficult to standardize a really good masseuse versus a really bad masseuse. Like they can go through the same training, but you might still have an entirely different outcome, right? And so what ends up happening is that that person builds a book of business within your business and then they walk from your business. And that happens with mm -hmm. virtually any service-based business, whether it's chiropractor trying to get chiropractors, gym owner trying to get personal trainers, like a uh, salon with hairstylists, it's all the same, their service, right? And so um, I don't like that component of it, right? Which is why I tend to lean more towards, you know, to the, to the extent that we can trying to productize as many pieces of the service as we can, because then people are loyal to the product and the brand that's associated with it rather than the individual who's uh, providing it. And then also when you productize it, you can also break it into individual chunks and then you can divide out the work between people so that it's not one person doing end to end on the thing. Right. And so then they're, they're more loyal again to the outcome or the product rather than to the person. So that's one. Number two is most people who practice agencies tend to be generalists, which is, you know, I talk about in the book why I think that's a terrible idea, but like, if you're going to be a generalist, you're competing against like, Oh, we'll be, you know what I mean? You're competing against <laughs> like the biggest people out there. And, and, and I, you absolutely can win in the general market. So despite what I said in the book in terms of like the riches and the niches, it is absolutely possible. It's just much harder, right? Like right now I can talk as a business generalist, but because of the track record that I have, mm -hmm. right? And so what happens is I think a lot of people try and get in as a business generalist, but they have no experience and they have no credibility. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the issue, right? So like if you want to compete at general business coaching, for example, not that I have a business coaching company, but at least a business advice company that I give away for free, right? <laughs> then you have to compete with me 
And it, it's going to be harder if you don't have context or experience across multiple industries to have more relevant experience. And so that's that's the reason, like the niching isn't because niching is special. It's just because it's easier to get really good at one thing that is to be really good at a lot of things. And I think that's like, that's the subtext for why niching makes more sense, right? And yeah. then on top of that, you can far more easily standardize the product offering so that you have less variability, which then increases or decreases the operational drag and increases your margins. Um, it also allows you to price differently so that you can compete in a smaller marketplace and own candidly a more valuable outcome, right? Because like if, a, you know, Ogilvy isn't going to provide that, well, first off, they wouldn't work with a local real estate agent, but if they were going to work with a local real estate agent, they wouldn't be able to provide the same value as somebody who only does real estate agents. And not right. only that, only does real estate agents who only sell commercial homes in the one to $5 million range. Because if you just did that, then you know exactly what the sales process would look like. You know exactly where the leads should get. You know what they should get worked on. You know what the price per deal is. You can price appropriately. And all of that's going to be optimized. And in terms of productizing what you're going to deliver, again, your team is going to know who the avatar is, how you're going to help them in every aspect of that process, right? Compared to uh, we market stuff which is really, really hard. It's all custom and it's hard to be competitive, right? Because then you're going to get priced just like everyone else in the marketplace, which is really difficult uh, to differentiate. And as marketers, we should know what that is. So it would make sense to at least start with ourselves. You mentioned the word productize a bunch of times, and it's a term that we use a lot. And at least in our programs, a lot of times what we're helping our clients do is like figure out, take that, that specialty and start packaging up so that they are not pure service-based. Um, but you touched on something that I haven't really, or at least worded it in a way where you talked about the, the chunking of the pieces then into delegating that. Can you, can you expand on that and maybe even touch on your experience from the early stages of gym launch or maybe any other business that you, you've seen yeah. do this? So I think the first thing that needs to happen is you have to have a clear customer journey. And so most people don't even have a customer journey. They have a rough idea of what has to happen, but they haven't actually like written it down. So it's like, right. well, the first step is for us as a company to have a shared understanding. Like you may think in your own head that you have a shared understanding, but you probably don't, right? Because if I were to ask your frontline employees, what does it look like? They probably will mess something up and you'll be horrified mm. at what they say the client journey is. Because you'll be like, oh my God, that's not what our client journey is. And it's like, and you wonder why clients aren't getting a good experience, right? And so it's like, first we have to agree upon this thing. Everyone's there. And it's like, okay, now we have to slice up these things into pieces that will uh, best uh, suit the team, uh, you know, for those specific, you know, roles, right? And mm-hmm. so you're going to probably have a different person who does onboarding than somebody who does client, you know, account management versus somebody who does uh, the creative. Like all of those are different roles and all might be necessary in the process that you create. Now, what I just described is a, a generalist approach, which would probably not be the right way to do it. It's like, how can we peel off the pieces that are the highest margin that we're the best at? Because at the end of the day, like everything comes down to like, where do we provide the most value and who do we provide that value to? And like, if we can answer those questions, then business gets a lot easier. It's like, well, and this is for everybody who's a generalist who needs to make the transition. Like the way that I would do this and approach this is I would look at my entire client base, historical and actual, and say, which of these clients were the best to deal with? Which of these accounts were the least trouble? And which of these did we make the most money on? Right. And so if you plot those, then you'll start to see that there's a clump, right? And there's probably going to be somewhere you made a lot of revenue, but not a lot of profit. You have some guys who are a lot, again, a lot of revenue, but they're a ton of work. But there's going to be a sweet spot where you have lots of profit, not a lot of work, high client satisfaction. And it might be like, we're really good at this one aspect or these two aspects are really good that we're really good at. And we serve this type of business. And it could either be niched in terms of there's levels to niching, right? You could just say local businesses or one level below that could be service-based local businesses, or it could be, um, you get what I'm saying here? Like you can, you can, yeah. you can try to think, slice and dice that group until you really can define it well, where it's like, it might be, it might be male founder tech companies, whatever, right? Because uh, I'm sure your audience is really, you know, varied in terms of who they serve. And so you might find out like tech companies have the budget and are really willing to spend the money and don't have a lot of feedback on creative. And they're just like, yeah, this is good. We needed a, a logo and that's that, right? Um, and then you can just, that's what you focus on. Because the thing is, is like, it also becomes, you know, for entrepreneurs, the biggest asset that we have in our net worth is going to be our business. And that means that the business in order for it to be valuable, um, it has to be sellable. And so a great book on this is John Werlow's book, Built to Sell. I think it's a really good story if you've read that. Yep. Um, that kind of depicts the issue that mo- I think the actual example is an agency. So it's probably. Yeah, it's like a, they do logos. Yeah. <laughs> it's really suitable for your audience. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, and so, yeah, that just tends to be the, the kind of the recurring issues. They don't think like business owners because they're still so fully integrated in the business. And so it's like in terms of sequence, it's like we have to get our offer right. Then we have to get our customer journey right. And we have to slice that up so that other people can do it so that now we're fully removed from the delivery. 
then we're still probably selling depending on the size of the people that you're dealing with, but probably a lot of them are still heavily involved in the sales and acquisition. And so then it's, how do we create, you know, a pipeline uh, of new business? And that can be whatever way you want. You know, you can go paid ads, you can go earn media, you can go own media, you can do manual outbound, you can do affiliates, you can do word of mouth and referrals. If you have a strong, a strong back in there, any of those ways you could do, but you have to pick one. And so for anybody who's under a million dollars, and you've heard my content before, but I'll just repeat it again. It's one product, one avatar, and one channel. And that is how you get from zero to a million. That's it. And what most people are doing is lots of products to lots of avatars on multiple channels and, yeah, so, yeah. and failing at all of them miserably and somehow wondering why, right? It's because like you can barely do one thing. How are you expecting to do to serve lots of different? It just doesn't make any sense. It's way and too hard. And when you say the channel, just to be specific of the ones that you kind of rifled off, like one committing to, to manual outbound would be an example. Or like if you're going to do paid media, does that mean like paid media only on Facebook or does that mean just paid media across all the channels. Paid media is a is a single bucket, right? And then yeah. inside of that, there's obviously you could go pre-roll YouTube ads, you could do Facebook, you do Instagram, you could do whatever, right? Google ads, you could Craigslist ads. There's a lot of ads you could run. But what I have found in scaling our companies on paid media, um, and then obviously, you know, as you know, with our newer stuff, we're we're more focused on the other three. Um, yeah. But it's easier to go from Facebook to adding YouTube than it is to go from Facebook to cold calling. So it's much easier to just add or remove a step in the friction of like having a call funnel yep. uh, from a different source because you usually just have to get the friction right. That's really the only variable with the different traffic sources. Whereas with manual outbound, it's like you literally are starting from scratch. And so whatever one you feel like you are best suited for, I would start there. I will say though that from a sellability, a company that is far more on the affiliates, manual outbound and word of mouth are going to be much more sellable entities than uh, paid advertising uh, earned media and uh, owned. You said that during dinner, you you made a comment. You know, I was fortunate enough to have dinner with you and Layla um, like a month ago now. And you made the comment of, you know, like the next channel that someone like myself could really focus on, even though it'll take longer to get dialed in is the manual outbound, because then you don't have to. And I think the words were, you don't have to be a dancing bear. <laughs> is Is that kind of why you think those three are more relevant? First, the sellability. Yeah, if you look at the biggest companies in the world, almost all of them have a foundation of the latter three, not the former three. It's all about like referrals being the biggest because it's the one that is quadratic in nature, right? Um, which is, you know, candidly, the reason most businesses don't make money or a lot of money is because they don't actually provide that much value. There's not a lot of what we would call customer surplus. So I'll give you an example of what customer surplus is. So if, if I deliver $10,000 of value and I charge $10,000, I will have a satisfied customer, but there will not be any surplus. They won't tell their friends about it. They had fair exchange, right? If I charge uh, $10,000 for $100,000 in value, they'll tell everybody they're not, right? And so there's a seesaw of how much, how much virality you want uh, in the product you have. Now, if you look at, again, the biggest companies in the world, they would prefer to have zero cost of acquisition, have shitloads of virality, and then deal with monetization later. That is what most, you know, a lot of them are funded. So they don't have to deal with this. So there is a sweet spot there, right? Like, and, you know, I, I sit in an interesting position because a lot of people are trying to look at what I'm doing with acquisition.com and they're like, what's the play? The real play is I don't need the money. Right? <laughs> like, so that's the magic, right? It's yeah. so, uh, you know, so I have a huge customer per surplus. The reason the book sells a thousand copies a day right now with no paid ads is because there's a big surplus, right? And so maybe if I, like, I had a bunch of people who read the, the early copies before I, before I launched it, they're like, dude, you should charge a hundred dollars, charge $500 for the book or whatever. And I'm like, I probably could have, but I would so much rather trade $99 to have your goodwill. That's far more valuable to me over the long haul, right? And the reality is that if I charge 99 cents, um, which is basically nothing because Jeffy B takes, takes 65 of the, the 99, um, <laughs> then uh, the likelihood that I get probably 20 times the people or 100 times the people who read the book um, is significantly higher. And that's where I'm going to, you know, I would prefer to have 100 people who know about the stuff and, and get value than have one person who gets $500 stuff, right? Totally. So you made a comment earlier about the, like, if I charge 10,000 and you only make 10,000, like you're probably not going to go tell anybody about it. So in the book, you talk about how to basically double your rates, raise your rates without having to actually change anything about the offer. And I want you to talk a little bit about that, but then kind of specifically around that, like the evolution to get to that, right? Because I know a lot of people in in this group that are watching this, A, they're, uh, they're definitely not charging enough. They know they're not charging enough, but 
some of those other things you talked about have been preventing them from solving a specific outcome that would even allow them to get to a multiple, you know, return. So like all these things start stacking on top of each other, but say someone specialized, they're doing something specific and they're still not charging enough. Can you talk to the path to raising your rates? So the problem is the price is the, is the, is the symptom, not the cause, right? So the cause is that people are not providing sufficient value. And so the whole book details how to break down every problem that your customer is dealing with, a specific customer, and then how to systematically solve each of those problems so that you can provide more value. Once you have provided significantly more value, then you can raise your prices. And then as a result of raising your prices, the price itself also confers more value to the product itself, which is kind of an interesting you know, dynamic in and of itself. Um, and so I know that <laughs> of late, what I said didn't seem contradictory to what I'm saying right now. It's like, I raise my prices at Gym Launch buy a lot. And I was way ahead of the market, but I also added $250,000 of top line on average. And so the reality is that the people that I was competing against were charging between 500 and 5,000 for adding between 500 and $5,000 to the business, right? I was adding $250,000 and I charged 40. So I was still way above them, but I was like double or triple or 10 times way above them in terms of the value that was being provided. And that you could verify on the fact that like, the business exploded, right? And that's that's the you know the reasoning behind it, which is why we didn't have to spend a ton in advertising. Like the first year in business, we asked, I think we spent a million dollars in advertising. We did twenty eight million. You get so much more return by having some level of customer surplus. I mean, sequentially, though, like you had gone and personally flown around the country and did this one on one launching these gyms, so you obviously had that experience to kind of I think probably know the value discrepancy. Yes, and so. What I'm hearing correctly is some of you listening might have done this enough times and already have seen the type of returns you can get, thus probably instantaneously can raise your rates. But some of you might have to earn it by actually going above and beyond, getting figuring out what that is and sequentially raising rates as you start getting those returns. Does that sound accurate? Yes. So let me tell two different two different ways of getting that. All right. The first is that you massively fix what you're doing and provide 20 times the value and charge five times the price that you currently are, right? And so if you do that, then you'll get both elements. You'll have a massive increase in value and you'll be able to provide that because you're at five times higher prices. So you'll have extra cash flow to be able to fulfill all of these things that you can do. And oftentimes the value that we can provide takes a one-time investment, um, but that you can yield, you know, returns over and over again. So for example, a book is a one-time investment, but then I continue to yield returns on that book over and over and over again. So it's like a lot of times we need to do more work on the onset than people end up doing. But I think I have a perfect example for this. That's actually, that might be perfectly relevant for this. So one of the, one of the, the, the companies that was using our software um, was an agency, right? And this agency owner, I, I would do one call a month with the agency owners just to like, you know, help them with business stuff. And every single month, same guy would get on and the same guy would, would bitch and moan about his customers. And he had niched down. He was only working with real estate agents. Um, and he was like, you know, the, they, they suck. They say they, that the leads are bad. No one works the leads. And it was the same conversation over and over and over and over again. And I was like, dude, stop your agency and go work the leads that you're getting. Go get your real estate license. Go work the leads. Go sell some houses. And then you'll be able to help them. And he didn't do it. And then finally, he got so fed up that he did it. And then within a month, he sold like seven and a half million in houses. Right. And I was like, okay, have you learned something about? He's like, oh, yeah. I, the, you know, what I was telling them to do, it, like, there's a couple different like nuances about how you had to do that different. And so what happens is everyone just regurgitates generic advice and they've never done it. And because they've never done it, they don't have the nuances and then the devil's in the details. The money is in, is, is in the, is in the tiny differences, not the massive things. Right. And so because he actually did it, I was like, now you can have conviction when you talk to somebody on the phone, you're like, dude, I'm working these leads myself. Like I just sold two houses this week. Like it works. And imagine how different the sales conversation is, how different he feels about the pricing that he's going to charge. And now the product truly is better. And so believe it or not crazy, he's now making way more money mind blowing. And so if you think about this for most people is they start getting into business where they actually provide no value. They don't know how to provide value. They took a course and know how to run Facebook ads or, or, you know, they, they did some sort of design in the past and they're okay at it. Right. And the reason they don't make more money is because they're okay. They're not that good. And so we have to figure out a way to provide far more value to a very specific avatar, make their entire lives amazing because all the work that we did ahead of time, which oftentimes is one-time work, right? It's just no one's willing to wait six months or a year to have a business that's 10 times as big. 
But that means that you have to forego six months to 12 months, right? Of just learning the craft to a way deeper level. And here's what's crazy is that when you do that, imagine the story marketers, put your marketer hat on the story that he can now tell. He could say, dude, I get it. I was so tired of it. I worked the damn leads myself. I figured out every one of the systems and now I'm giving that to you. Now they're like, oh shit, no one else has done that. Right. <laughs> and when I started the, the gym business, like I had six gyms of my own, still didn't feel secure enough to actually say that I could help gym owners. Then I started flying out because I wanted to make sure everyone was getting way more value than I was charging for it. And I did 33 turnarounds almost in, in, in like 18 months. Mm. And so I went to, we went to 33 different markets where we sat at the front desk, we sold the membership, we did everything right for them. We fronted the money. And so at that point, when I then say, hey, I just launched 33 gyms personally over the last 18 months, I can tell you that this will work in your market. Hop on a call. It's a story that no one else can say. So it's not an angle. It's not a hook. It's just, it's true. Then, and here's the cool thing. As soon as I wanted to transition to the done with you model, I had 33 gyms that I was just like, hey, remember that thing I did? They were like, yeah. I was like, do you want to want me to show you how I did it? And they're like, yeah. I had 33 high ticket clients immediately, mm -hmm. right? And then from there, client 34 who gets on the phone, I'm like, well, here, I'll just set you up with one of the gyms that, that, that's doing it right now. And they're like, dude, just buy it. I didn't need sales. It was just like, dude, just yeah. buy it. Buy it. So it. You, you alluded to value in that. And I think in consuming a lot of your content and then going to research this, I haven't found many people that have actually defined it <laughs> yet. You, yet you have, uh, you know, we all think it's like, Oh, like go serve, you know, how to content, blah, 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 blah. But like you actually put together an equation for it. Can you, can you talk through that? Yeah. And, um, I think I dealt with the same issue you do, right. Which is like, you know, price is what you pay value is what you get. And so everyone can talk about price all day, but no one talks about value. They just say the word value over and over again. There you go. The value yeah. equation. There's the equation. The way that I came to this was trying to think about two products that were the same and had different prices. And so I was like, why is this price higher than this? And so I just tried to think about it. Um, and those are the four buckets that I came with. I think you could probably break those into further smaller buckets, but those are kind of the big chunks that exist. And so for the audience, the fastest way that you can provide value is look what everyone else in the market is doing and do it in half the time. Simplest, simplest way. Like the thing that people value the most is their time. Right. And then effort and sacrifice is a nod to convenience. Right. Effort is what you what a prospect has to now begin doing that they don't want to do that they weren't doing before they started working with you. Sacrifice is what they have to stop doing. that They want to do that they no longer get to do as a result of working with you. So it's just two sides of the same coin. So, for example, you might be saying, ah, oh, like, I mean, I'm getting them all these leads, but now they're incurring the cost of now I have to pay someone to work leads. We have to we have to follow up with all these people. I've got all these appointments like those are costs. Right. And we have to look at every cost that's going that they're going to incur as a result of doing business with us. And solutions create more problems. That's always how it is, right? And so if we can solve more of these problems that we're creating, then we can create more value in the end, right? But back to the time delay, the single thing that I focus on with virtually every business that you start working with on the acquisition.com side, the portfolio, is how can we decrease the time delay to money, right? And so I'll give you the easy example that you just gave with the marketing, right? If I, you know, you start working with a company and, you know, they swipe the card and they start working and say, hey, it's going to take 30 days. And then effort and sacrifice, you have to give me all this creative, you have to give me all access to all this stuff. You have, you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to. It's like, man, there's a lot of effort and sacrifice here. And especially if it's ongoing, every week you owe me this, every month you owe me this, we have to go on numbers every week, we're gonna have this cadence, blah, 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 blah. Like it's all stuff that now I have to do that I wasn't doing before, right? Yeah. And so what we try and do is like, imagine a different marketing agency that as soon as they swipe the card, right? Their phone rang with a qualified lead, right? Holy cow, different client experience, different impressions, different expectations that immediately get set and way more goodwill right off the bat. You just bought yourself three months of forgiveness from that first phone call in 30 seconds. Mm. So you already know my perceived likelihood of achievement went through the roof. My buyer's remorse went way down, you know, and then the likelihood that I'm going to ascend to a higher level of service or buy the next thing triples, right? And so for us, we always try and engineer wins as fast as humanly possible. For us with a new client, we like to have it in the first seven days. So for us, the, the main KPI that we will drive as a company is what a client is going to make in the first, for us, it's 14, but like we try and get it in the first seven, but what we collect. And, and is this gym launch specifically? With all of them. Oh. All of them. We try and figure out how we, and, and if you're like, well, it, my industry is different. Think creatively. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like I can't meet with everybody individually, but like, I promise you, we've made this work with every, even the long buying cycles, like the mortgages and the, and the, and the real estate guys. Yeah. Those are longer buying cycles, but there are still wins that you can still have emotionally that you can still deliver in the first seven to 14 days. Speed is so, is so valuable to people, especially business owners. If I sign a contract and nothing happens for 30 days, I think the company I'm dealing with is shit immediately. I automatically assume that. 
right? But if I see activity, I see predictors, I see activation points that are happening, then I know. So if for us, uh, I'll use the gym example. If we know that we're going to have to pull all these levers, right? We're going to change the, the number of people they're taking per session, their price points, how we're going to sell, change their lobby, all the different aspects of this we're going to have to change, right? Those are all heavy things. They're important, but they take yeah. time. Well, I'm going to just peel off the, the fastest, easiest win and deliver that in the first 14 days so that I gain the goodwill to then say, now you trust me enough to do these other things so it's will work and actually make even more money. It'll just take you a little bit of time. But now they believe me and I've bought myself the goodwill. So how that, that mini win, I think in the book you talked about, like you, you're getting them like a $2,000 sale in seven days or whatever. Is that just a strategy to show them that they can make 2K doing this, but it isn't necessarily, is it a piece of what they would be doing as they roll out those other things that you said felt heavier? It can be, it can be either. Got it. So, a weight loss example to just to give a totally like a B2C example, like we would give people basically a starvation diet for their first, you know, few weeks, even though we knew it wasn't sustainable. And we would do that because there's tons of research that supports that people actually have better long-term weight loss outcomes if they have a short-term win. So if someone loses 10 pounds in the first two weeks, now they believe me and I'm saying, Hey, this isn't going to be something we can do forever. I just want to show you that our stuff works and we know what we're doing. We have this in our back pocket. This is to show you, we do know what we're doing but we do think we need to transition to this, which is going to be slower, but we're going to be able to help you lose it for good. Right. And so now it's like, but if I said, Hey, it's going to be slow. We're going to help you lose it for good. It's like the SEO argument. How long am I going to wait? How much trust do I have to have? Cause like everybody, it's like, yeah, it's going to take six months for SEO to start working. Maybe. Right. But maybe you're just a scam artist from online. That's going to say that and just collect six months of billings and ne- literally do nothing. And the way that you create these early wins is again, you look at the customers that you have had the most success with. And then you say, what did the top 10% of my customers go through? What was different about what they went through in the beginning versus what these guys went through in the beginning? And then that becomes, at least preliminarily, because you don't have any baseline, those become your activation points, which means that in the first 30 days, these are the one or two or three things that we want to deliver to every customer. And then all of the client experience and onboarding and, and customer success is geared around driving those activation points. Because we know, like, this is posthumously correlative, right? So we're looking after the fact and saying, well, these things happened here. We don't know if all of them are important, but we know that if we do all of them, we'll probably have some success. And then piece by piece, we'll discover more and we may be able to peel some back and be like, okay, we thought this was important. They don't care about as much as this, but these two things are the main thing, right? Like in HubSpot, when they get a new customer on, they know that they have to get someone to use five different functionalities in the CRM. If they use five different functionalities or more, then the likelihood they stick is like forever, right? But you got to get them to five. Right. And so I know that in a different CRM world for uh, online trainers, because we're involved in that space too, they have to get their first five clients. So if they get five clients, they never cancel, but they need five. And we have to deliver five as fast as possible. So even if the strategy that you use to get the first five is different than you get to get the next 100, if this one happens faster, then do this one first and then earn the trust to then start this, this journey. If you mm. want to be CEO, cool, show them you can run paid ads and get them leads so they know you know what you're talking about and then start the SEO journey. Makes sense. Yeah. Dude. So you talk about, I believe, I forget what you called it. Maybe it was the cycle of price or the price. I forget which one it was, but it was tied to the delivery cube. And I've looked through the book multiple times to see if I can find where it is. And I'm like, at this point, I don't know if it was one of your YouTube videos or I've, cause I listen to everything you do, but you talk somewhere about like when you are identifying how you're going to deliver the, the solution delivery vehicle, of all those problems, there's the ones obviously you want to aim in totality, high value, low cost, which is where, you know, the ability to go to um, information and, and showing people the done with you is, is really strong. But somewhere you said it's okay to have some high value, high cost things, totally. but like probably not more than one or two. Yeah. Yep, um, yep, that's the delivery cube. Yep. It's page 89. All so, right. um, yes. And so I, I'm a big believer in, in kind of utilizing the Tesla model. So Yes, we, we talk about that fairly often here as well. Okay, yeah. So a lot of people get started trying to, like, everyone tries to think about scale before they have value, which is silly, <laughs> right? Before they even know who their avatar is, right? And I think that's just, I think it's just silly. There's no other word for it. It's just silly. You're not going to, it's just, it, it's just silly. And instead, you'll have way better marketing, way better stories, know your avatar better, solve more problems, just have way more, you'll just, your hands will be, you know, you roll your sleeves up, you'll get way more dirty. You don't need to actually worry about this done for you thing being your business. Everyone has this fallacy in thinking that like the first thing they sell is the thing they're going to sell for the rest of their life. It just consider it getting paid to do R and D. It's what it is. You're getting paid to do research and acquiring customers profitably for done for you is probably the easiest thing in the entire world because it's so easy to sell, right? 
It is harder to deliver. Absolutely. But if you learn how to deliver that, because you should, then doing the next level down and doing done with you or doing two levels down and doing complete DIY becomes easier because now you have the story that works and makes sense. It's like, hey, we have our done with you clients that are $20,000 a month. But if you want to just use the same system that we use and just do, and will help you along the way, you can just pay 10 grand one time and learn the whole system, you know, or get certified through us or blah, 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 blah. Right. And so it's way easier to acquire customers with high done for you because most people, and I told, I don't know if I told this, I think I told the story in a YouTube thing, but I had a friend who got laid off. He was a chiropractor and he was like, Hey man, I need to make money. And I was like, do you want to make money or do you want to be a chiropractor? He's like, I want to make money. I was like, cool. So just use the gym lunch system. So he just started selling weight loss and not even doing the chiropractor thing. And in the first, uh, month or two months, he actually made no sales. And I was like, bro, what's going on? And he was like, dude, I'm still trying to get my offer right. Cause I don't want to overcommit and not be able to fulfill. And I was like, how many clients do you have? He was like, zero. And I was like, why are we having this discussion? I was like, sell the farm, give away everything, get people to say yes, get people to give you money. And then we'll have cash flow that we can start solving problems with. Right. And you have no idea what your clients want. Cause you haven't fucking sold anyone yet. So like go sell some stuff. And then what happens is uh, once you have all the solutions that you plan on delivering, maybe your first couple of people, you deliver everything, right? And even if you broke even on that, I'd rather break even with cash flow because once I have flow, right? Create flow, monetize flow, then add friction. So it's like, let's create the flow with a crazy offer. That's what the book's about, right? Monetize the flow because we can charge a lot for it because we're going we're gonna to go to their house. And you feel like, oh, I don't know if that's sustainable. I flew around the country for a year and a half actually going to people's gyms and working their front desk. And so people forget that. They're like, man, I want to do what Jim Lunch did, but you're not willing to do what Alex did. So you got to pick, right? Yeah. And so if you want to be in a niche, then go work the front desk, go fly out to a salon, go fly out to five salons, 10 salons, right? And yeah. learn the different markets, learn the different nuances, learn how different salons work, right? And then on your sales calls, when you do decide to make your pivot down to a more scalable model, right? You can say, listen, 80% of clinics are doing this. This is all horseshit. The 20% that drives all the profit is this. That's what I'm going to help you focus on. So then you end up trimming and stacking everything that doesn't matter out and just focusing, productizing on the most valuable, highest profit things that you discovered through the R&D that you got paid to do. Yes. For some of the newer clients that might be watching this end of the replay, this is what we tell you, tell you to do. Um, so I have a question because you... In the book, you know, you, like you said, you list out all of the things, all the problems that they have, and then identify solutions. Then you take them to the, to the delivery cube. What are different ways? Which is an amazing exercise. Um, but something we both, I believe, have similar thoughts on is to sell something up front that has a an end date with a clear outcome, and then, uh, as you call it, downsell your upsell. So can you talk about like when someone has this laundry list of things that they can do? How do you figure out where to draw that line? on what should the front end be? So you want consumables to be recurring and you want the one-time things to be the one-time value, right? That's the simple, simple state of mm -hmm. thing. So I actually just drew this out yesterday because I was thinking about this. So maybe this will be some off the, you might see some YouTube content on this. Um, if, I'm building, if I'm building recurring revenue, right? Then what I want, so this is my, uh, my, little, my little graph here, right? Yeah. You've, got, you've got physical, digital, and then you've got collateralized and consumable, right? And so I, I, I'm just going to go, I'm going to super zoom out and then I'm going to come back in. All right. So a simple consumable would be like toothpaste, right? No one here is really on subscription for toothpaste, but a toothpaste company gets sold by, you know, bought by Procter & Gamble for a zillion dollars, right? And it's because you're still recurring. You're just buying once every month or whatever, right? But it is the weakest type of recurring and it's a physical uh, consumable, right? A level above that would be a physical that's collateralized. So razors, you buy the razor and then the consumables are the razor. You buy the printer and the consumables are the ink cartridge. You put your stuff in storage and then you have to keep paying for the storage, but there's collateral, right? They have something of yours that they're, that they're, that they're paying for. These are both in the physical realm. In the digital realm, same thing versus consumables and, uh, and things that are collateralized. So the ideal world in terms of business value is to have something that's purely digital and has collateral, which is why CRMs are so valuable because they have all your payment info, all your contacts, all your everything. And for you to leave is really hard because they have collateral. They have your stuff, right? Dropbox has all your files. So it's hard to leave those, right? And so to go to the consumables, that's where, what are the things that a business is going to consume on a, on a regular basis? They're going to consume financial services. So they're going to have a bookkeeper. They're going to consume marketing services. So they're going to have an agency or a media buyer, right? And so like for us, it's like, you want to sell the system 
as a one-time thing, and then all the things that the system consumes as the recurring thing. So you've got the machine, and then you've got inputs and outputs, right? So you build the machine for the one time, and then you sell the inputs because they need more inputs over and over again once you've helped them build the machine. And then you can price those according to what the machine that you have built for them creates. And so this is the biggest question I get all the time. I'm just going to tack it on because I figure somebody's going to ask it anyways. <laughs> My clients are broke. They can't afford what I want to charge. Well, the average gym owner makes $36,000 a year, a little less than that, actually. And we charge forty two. Right. And that's our back end program. Front end program 16. So we go 16 and then 42. That's a lot of money. And that's twice. Uh, that's 42,000 just for the record. <laughs> and so that's what they make more than what they make in a year. That's more than what they make currently, but not more than what they make once they use the machine that we have them built. So we price based on the value that we know that our machine is going to help them produce. Right. And so it's the same thing where like, and this is why we were able to just crush everybody who's in the agency world because they would try and go to gym owners and sell them leads or sell them services and they could never charge more than a thousand bucks a month because there was so little margin because gym owners weren't making any money on the leads that they had and they couldn't charge more, you know they couldn't they would they would get priced out over 10 bucks a lead and they say hey i can't do this anymore it's 10 bucks a lead our guys can spend 50 bucks a lead because they make so much more money per customer because we show them how to sell high ticket how to set up the sales room what the offer is supposed to be we give them all the fulfillment stuff we show them how to sell supplements transaction we give them all of the help to do that so that they can liquidate the cost of acquisition or make a profit on the acquisition and sell the back end and so the idea is you sell the system right and then the recurring the downsell the upsell is going to be the consumables of that system and so like and just cuz the Gym Launch is the only consulting one that I know of that you're involved in. Like in a coaching, training, consulting model that done with you, what does that look like from a consumable piece on the back end then? So we worked with agencies through Allen. So what they would sell on the agency front end was they would sell the system, right? That's the defined end thing. Is that by the end of this, so like what's the clear deliverable? So let's say it's um, salon owners, right? So it's like, okay, salon owners, I'm going to help you double the average ticket of the person who walks in the door and five times the LTV by using our four-step, you know, appointment system that XYZs and we'll put physical products in and we'll, we'll show you how to add recurring with the hair colorings and cuts and whatever, right? That's the system. Once they have the model, then they automatically make way more money from everything else that they ever do. Awesome. That means that we can charge more. Cool. So let's solve that problem first so that we can then price what we want. And so then what we sold on the back end was shows because that's what they consumed. They consumed shows. That's what the machine that we built them eats. It eats people walking in the door. And so we have to sell them the people that it has to eat. And so uh, on the gym side, what we did uh, was slightly different, but same concept is that we would test. We spent about 50,000 a month testing ads in a, a bunch of markets. We had like 10 or 20 markets that we do representative tests in. Um, and then when we had the winners, we would just license the winners to everyone. So for them, they knew how to run ads, they had the machine, but I would immediately save them on all of the, the lost ad spend that they would normally have testing and not getting results. And so if you knew that every single ad that you had was a winner, how valuable would that be? Very, and for us, it's high margin because it's media, right? So it's 100% gross margins. And so that was one of the things that we had on the back end. In addition to that, it's like, what are the other problems, right, that are gonna come up from uh, you know, having this new machine? Well, now they have to hire more trainers. Well, our hiring system is going to be on the back end. You have to hire salespeople. So the, the sales scripts and the, and the ads for hiring salespeople on the back end. You're going to have to train those people. That's why we have something that we call boiler room so that all of the salespeople from all the gyms meet every morning on a call that we host to train their sales teams, right? Because that's something that's consumable that they're going to have to keep doing over and over again. So it's like, what are the activities in the business that have to continue to occur as a result of the system that we sold them? And then those are all the things that we will bundle and sell on the back end. So when people are like, I don't know what I'm going to sell on the back, it's like, it means because you haven't solved any problems on the front. Mm. If you solve problems on the front, there's going to be problems on the back and you just get to solve those problems. I love that. You obviously talk in the book about guarantees and I've seen a lot of new ads out in the marketplace with guarantees, which I'm like, oh, they read the book. Can you talk about like, I was having a conversation with a, one of my buddies about this. Like you can obviously use a guarantee as like a sales tool if you're selling via the phone. Is that like V1 of rollout is I'm going to use this as a tactic to get them over the line if there's an objection, because sometimes there is an objection where you even need to offer a guarantee. But then there's also the putting it in your marketing Mm -hmm. Is that the appropriate rollout? Like test it on call as a tool. And then if it's working, bring it out to the marketplace. Like it almost is your offer if the guarantee can be good enough. I think that there's lots of ways to skin the cat. So I, I, I don't, I don't want to give like a, a broad sweeping generalized answer for that. Yeah. I think testing it on the phone is a good idea. And then making it the offer also works. I think there's two pieces that I, I think everyone, at least that I, I try to confer or whatever, tell people is that one, 
for many people, a guarantee is a, is a structured risk. It's a risk where you know all the variables. So maybe you need to test it on the phone for a handful of people, see the results and then measure. But nine times out of 10, you're gonna make more money having the guarantee. You will sell more people than you otherwise would have, even minus the extra returns that you'll have as a result. Most people though, are still so afraid of making a guarantee that they make the contingency so, so extreme that the guarantee is worthless, mm. right? And the thing is, is if the guarantee is worthless, it's not as compelling, right? <laughs> so I try to guarantee things that I'm almost afraid of guaranteeing. And if I'm afraid, then it means they'll get greedy. And if they get greedy, it means I'll make money. And so big picture, here's, here's just a thought experiment that I like to demonstrate the power of it. So most of us are in B2B services who are listening to this, I would imagine. And so if you're B2B, let's say that your offer was, I'll double your profit in 30 days. I'll double your business in 30 days, whatever, right? Something crazy, right? Or I'll pay you twice the amount of money you paid me back. How difficult would it be to sell that? Not at all. And so if anyone is struggling to get customers, think about that as an extreme example, right? On the flip side, you have everyone else's stuff, which is pay me, maybe get results, maybe don't, doesn't really matter. I get paid either way. That's, the, that's what most people offer if you were to boil it down to soup and nuts, right? And so the question is, is there a place between extreme A and extreme B where we could peel off one or two of these things from the side, still have a really strong guarantee that's very compelling um, and ultimately sell more and make more? Now, the underlying point of the entire book that's unspoken, which I think you picked up and a lot of people picked up, is that we were like, well, if I guarantee that, what happens if they don't get the outcome? It's like, then fix the product. So this was the first book, to my knowledge, that was wrapped as a marketing book, right? But the book doesn't talk about marketing at all. It's a product book. It's a book on product, right? And so the problem is people aren't providing value. That's the problem. And that's the basic problem for all the businesses that don't make money. Because you should be able to say a really bold claim. And if you can't say a really bold claim, then solve why you can't say a really bold claim rather than not making it. So I think it's just a better question, which is like, how could we guarantee that they're going to double their income? How could we do that? Because if you ask better questions, you'll get better answers rather than how can we trick people into saying, thinking it's a guarantee when it really isn't. Yeah. Because that's not how you create wealth. You create wealth through value, right? And, then, and that's that, like, you can only sell people once. And this is the whole, the, the Dan Kennedy... Um, most people get customers to make sales rather than make sales to get customers, right? And it sounds like a minor semantic difference, but it's important because most marketers that exist in the, in the information or internet space, which is a lot of people, right? They try to get a customer to just make a sale. That's the whole goal for them is the sale, right? Rather than I'd rather create the relationship that I can then have, have an ongoing exchange of value over and over and over again, which makes you unbeatable. It's so hard to compete against a business that, that just consistently provides more value than they charge for. But people are like, well, then I need to lower my price. You can increase the price to value discrepancy by lowering your price. You absolutely can do that. That's what Netflix does. That's what Dropbox does. That's what, you know I mean, like think about it, $9 a month. Think about how many things that we charge on the internet that are charged for more than $9 a month that are way less viable than Netflix. Yeah. A lot, right? But for most of us, we don't have tons and tons and tons of funding to be able to do that. And so the other way of doing it is increasing the value, right? And then correspondingly increasing the price to a certain degree. So you still have a discrepancy between what you charge and what they get, um, but it's still far more than what you currently are doing, which is why it's like, how do I create value? Solve all the problems they have. And you don't have to do done for you for all the problems. That's why I created the delivery cube. It's like, I, I give the example of groceries because I think it's such a simple thing everybody can understand. Like if you need to start losing weight, Susie's got to start buying groceries differently, right? Well, let's think of all the different ways we could solve that problem. Right? We, could, we could create a calculator that helps her calculate it. We could pre-make PDFs that already have the list for every week. We could, we could uh, pre-populate an Instacart that already has each week already preloaded. She clicks it with one button. We could have an uh, affiliation with a meal prep company. The first time we could do a tour with her, meet her at the grocery store and go with her at her local store. How valuable would that be? We could provide tech support during period of hours that when everyone goes grocery shopping, we're there to respond and show and say, hey, and they can text us if they're curious about if this can of soup or this can of soup is the right can, right? Like we could have call support. We could have, you know what I mean? All of these things are different ways of solving the same one problem. And so the idea is we do need to solve every problem or every perceived problem to get the sale, right? And then the business economics behind it is where we figure out which of these different ways of solving the problem provides the most value and has the most margin for us as a business and is most scalable. I love it. I know we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, guys, again, if you haven't picked up his book yet, Amazon, you can get it on Kindle, hard copy, 
he makes literally almost no money on on any of these things. He's doing it because he's an awesome human being. <laughs> thirty five cents, my friend. Thirty five cents. Yeah, thirty. Sorry, thirty five cents, guys. Thirty five cents. But uh, a couple of just random off the cuff, quick questions. So since starting acquisition.com, right? Like you mentioned, you'd say, you know, companies above 3 million, but really it's more like 5 million. Um, and you have kind of an interesting dynamic of companies, at least from what you've told me about what types they are. What's been the most like surprising thing that you've seen from these owners as you've kind of inserted yourself into their businesses? The businesses that we work best with have a clearly defined integrator and visionary. So married couples work really well, or people who have two, two partners that are clearly defined. Um, they work really well because usually we just need to fix the model and they blow up. When it's the single founder, we need to help them find that integrator operator. Um, sometimes they're in the business, but maybe they're not as strong as they should be. So that, that tends to take more time. But for most businesses that are at that three, five-ish million, we usually need to figure out a way to make the lifetime gross profit per customer higher. That's usually, which is what's the next offering, you know what I mean, that we're going to provide and how are we going to sell it? How are we going to price? How are we going to deliver on it in a way that's scalable and whatnot? And that usually will get someone from, you know, it depends on the size of the market, but you know, from 5 million to, you know, 20 or 25, that's usually the next kind of step for most of those guys. So you mentioned next offer and also to piggyback off what you said earlier, one product, one prospect, one channel to get you to a million. Pretty sure I saw Layla say on Instagram to 10, that could get you to 10 million. So with the front end, back end, like the continuity piece, do you consider the continuity more of an extension of the front end versus like it's the next offer? Like when should someone be adding continuity? Cause I know like we have a back end program and we're obviously sub 3 million, we're above one, but like, where does it make sense? And is that actually a different offer? It depends on, so I would say I would categorize them. So six ways of increasing lifetime gross profit per customer, right? Price, so increase the price, decrease the cost, get them to buy more times, upsells, cross-sells, downsells, right? Those are the, the six ways of doing it. So if we're thinking about the back end, is either an upsell or cross-sell or downsell, I would say it just depends on what the category is. So if we're delivering more of the same thing, then I would consider that a downsell because it's like downsell the upsell. It's like, it's consuming the, the thing that's going to feed the machine. And if you do that ad adequately, you really don't have churn because they always need the thing that feeds the machine, right? The upsells, which is usually where we will try and build some sort of upsell, but most times people try and cross sell. And that is the that is a mistake. That is what most entrepreneurs jump to, which is I have a distribution base, I'll sell them something else. And usually that's not the time to do it because they end up having two companies and then they're CEO of two companies and you can't be CEO of two companies. Because if you look at every Fortune 500, they're CEO of one company. The only exclusion is Elon and he's not actually CEO of any of them. He's the owner and founder. And so there's really no Fortune 500 company that is like, yeah, yeah I'm CEO of Home Depot and uh, Dairy Queen. You know what I mean? It's like, that's not, but we do that all the time as entrepreneurs because we think for some reason if we started in the company to solve all our problems, when in reality, we just create double the problems that we had and we still never advance past the point of our incompetence, which is where I can tell you, this is one of the themes that I've seen repeated over and over and over again. So I can drive this one, which is you will make the amount of money based on what level of entrepreneur you are. That's like level of entrepreneur times opportunity size. That is what, that is what the amount of money that you will make, right? And so most people entrepreneur wise, um, they'll have a $3 million business and they'll start a second business and then they'll have two one and a half million dollar businesses with less profit. Mm. This happens in the brick and mortar world all the time. Yeah. They have one location that's really profitable. They start a second location, then they start a third location. Right. What happens with some of these generalist service providers that they add a different service, but arguably it's a completely different business. It's a totally different business. Exactly. And so until you can really transition to owner, which everyone thinks they are, but the reality is that they just outsource sales, but they're still CMO, they're still CEO, they're still COO, right? They still have four hats on and they think that somehow they're, because they are owners also, that they are owners exclusively when that is not the reality. Mm -hmm. And so um, for the companies that we're working with, like in the beginning, it's like, I'll consolidate. So we have focus. We drive the, the one channel, we maximize what we have there. So we know that we can put somebody who's in charge of that channel. Then we can take time from the owner to who's really still chief product officer, right? Also that hat um, and really create the next product offer. And sometimes it takes time. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it might take six months just to get those two things to happen. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. where when we try and work with entrepreneurs, we want to have an extended time horizon, which is like a, a 12 week program is not going to help someone go from 5 million to 30 million. Right. <laughs> which yeah. is why we, we take equity in the companies that we're working with because we're looking for people who are like, sometimes you have to take a step back in order to take three steps forward. And that's yes. just true. Like if you're offering six things and you have to cut five of them because they're not profitable, your revenue will drop. You'll also have to get rid of teammates that you don't need. But now the new business may be far more profitable. I'll give you one example that might just drive this home. 
Cool. So the first company I took on for acquisition.com had a $1.6 million, um, which is small, but I really like the guy. $1.6 million brick and mortar business and they had a $500,000 a year agency. All right, that was helping this type of brick and mortar business. And so what I told him to do was I hated the, hated the model. <laughs> so we killed the business. I killed the $500,000 a year business. It's making him money, right? We killed it. And then we started the new model, which is what we do now, which is we own all the locations. And so now we have 10 locations. We open a new location every month. And so that business went from what it was doing then to now 14 months later, it's doing 200,000 a week, right? But for the first 90 days, revenue went down. But it's like, it's a, that's why I'm there too, to be like, breathe. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> like, it's fine. Like, you see where we're going. Like, you see how things are getting simpler. Like, we have to get simpler, pare down, focus. And then we can have the explosive growth because it's really easy to do one thing a hundred times. It's very hard to do one thing, a uh, hundred things one time. Mm -hmm. which is what most people do in their businesses, especially all the custom guys. You'll never sell the business. You'll never scale the business. It's horrible. Yeah. So, Last yeah. question before you tell us again, where we can go for all the free stuff. And, and also I think you should share why you're doing this. Cause I think it's really awesome. But like, so again, this is more of a selfish one, but like training, coaching space, like what do you feel like we're all missing that like we need to get right in order to kind of build something of substance? Most people haven't done it. I mean, most, like if we're being super real, most people haven't done the thing that they're selling, they had to do. I mean, how many business coaches who talk about scaling a business that never scaled a business before they started? Right. Just, you know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. that's the real real. It's because everyone, everyone's so status driven and everyone wants, to, everyone wants to appear successful before they actually are. Everyone wants to fake it till they make it. But I'll tell you, if you make it, you don't have to fake it. Amen. And so the whole thing with acquisition.com is Layla and I have probably taken out 45 million in dividends out of the businesses over the last four or five years. And the new chapter, I feel like, is the, the scorecard is changing for me from revenue and profit to just kind of like meaning and things that I, that I drive joy from. And so I thought, what is the most valuable thing that I can give to the marketplace besides money? Now, we donate, you know, we donate a couple million bucks over the last two years to charities that we find meaning in, which are usually ed education based. But like, I believe education is the thing that's going to set everyone free. And so I think that most of us, anybody who went to like formal college was kind of gypped. I think if you can have, if you make the same money after a four year, 200,000, imagine a four year, $200,000 coaching program that you made the exact same money afterwards. It's ridiculous. And no one yeah. calls a scam, which is hilarious to me. But anyways, so my thought process is, can I give and, you know, the people who are teaching business never had a business, like all sorts of stuff, right? In the colleges too. But the most valuable thing I can do in the marketplace is give all this, the experiences, the skills, the traits, and the beliefs that have shaped where we are now to everyone. And I know that with media, I can give that all away for free at no cost. And so the whole idea with acquisition.com is just give away more value for free than other people charge for. I mean, it's, that's, the, that's the strategy. And then hopefully get people from zero to, you know, three, five million on their own with no assistance. And if you're the type of person that doesn't need assistance and was able to use the stuff that we gave, then you'd be a perfect fit for the type of business that I want to, you know, invest in and then help grow to the next thing, because I know that you won't need the handholder, right? And so, you right. know, my works, I know that you work. And so as a result, we can kind of work off of shared, shared trust. And, you know, the, the downside risk for me is that I just help a lot of people for free, which I love it, man. Really well, that's we good. all appreciate it. I know I, I appreciate it. Guys, if you haven't gotten the book, I'll drop links in the thread below this, but definitely download the book or all three. Growth Hack, read the book while listening to the audio book at the same time. Learn that from Alex himself and you will read the book a whole lot faster. Uh, thanks again, man. Really appreciate you. No, you bet. And just for everyone, acquisition.com, you don't have to opt in anything. So. Slash training. Yeah, slash training. You don't have to opt in anything. You can just click there. And if you see that there's locked courses, because I just haven't made them yet. But yeah, you can go there. You can watch all of them. There's downloads and everything. You just take them. Awesome, man. Thanks again. We appreciate you. You bet. Appreciate you. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.